so I think a lot of what we're doing is, is kind of looking at some of these larger issues and saying how do we look at our food system uh, from a sustainability point of view? How do we look at changing it so that it's not dependent and relying on a source of energy that's, that's temporary, uh, that has a lot of effects on the world? Uh, but beyond that, I think there's other issues. I think there's the issue of childhood obesity, health. Uh, with a lot of the industrial agriculture, we have a lot of uh, corn syrup, corn-derived products, and things like that. Not only is there a lot of fossil fuel that goes into that, but it's not healthy for people. Um, we have a lot of problems with uh, obesity, diabetes, uh, heart disease. Uh, you know, it has an economic impact in terms of lost productivity. It has an impact on the quality of life. Um, people are much more sedentary. My name is Esther Muchiri. I actually come from Kenya, from a, a farming community. So um, I definitely understand and have grown in, in, a, in a perspective of uh, food just growing to where you are. And uh, I appreciate healthy food, uh, f fresh food. And uh, coming here to the U.S., I had a very interesting experience where I went to the supermarket and I bought stuff and I, it didn't taste like food. It didn't taste like food or like what I'm used to. And um, just working with kids and starting to ask them to eat healthy, fresh food, uh, and they couldn't even, they, they weren't ready to do that. They, they were very, they were opposing every aspect of me trying to force fresh food to them. Or even knowing the importance of eating fresh food really struck a chord in my heart. And I started very seriously looking into ways of, in, you know, working with communities to make sure that people are growing their own food and eating it from right where they, they are, they live. And, um, the food yeah. desert is a, a phenomena where uh, you have very limited access to healthy food choices in a neighborhood. We, for instance, in this neighborhood live in a food desert where uh, we are at uh, Miles and Broadway. Um, the closest grocery store is about two miles away um, uh, from us. There are neighborhoods here where, you know, within a two mile radius, there isn't any fresh produce available, uh, fresh or healthy food choices, not just produce. Um, so there are studies that have shown that pe people who live in food deserts tend to eat fewer fruits and vegetables irrespective of their income. So if you compare low income people living in neighborhoods which have outlets of fresh produce, whether it's a grocery store, a farmer's market or uh, what have you, they tend to eat better than people who live in food deserts where there aren't any outlets of uh, healthy food choices. And especially coming to this country and realizing how people are detached from their food, the food that they eat, which is the central thing. It's a basic need. You know, it's a basic need. And if we don't think about it, you know, wh who are we going to be? I mean, we, we can't develop without a healthy workforce. We can't develop without, um, we, can, we can't even look after ourselves if we're not healthy. It, it's as basic as that. And when we move away from food, that's why I see all the problems that we struggle with, especially in, the, in, in a country, in, a, in developed countries. If you look at uh, how people uh, spend their food, uh, you know, how, what fraction of their income people spend on food, Food. In America, people spend the lowest amount on food out of their entire income. We spend about uh, between 9 to 11 percent on food compared to other countries where it's between 20 to 80 percent, depending on their uh, economic uh, level. So food, while we complain that it is expensive, you know, it, it's, it's good to realize that we really don't spend that much on food. The problem is some of the food is really available at extremely low cost and often those low cost foods are uh, low quality foods also and by low quality foods what I mean is that they are nutritionally really low in quality. They have, they are um, very high in sugars because you can buy um, high fructose corn syrup at very low cost in the, in the market so you see it in a lot of food products. Um, Larger portions are very common because it's easier to sell larger portions at lower costs. Um, so the, the, these foods that are available at low cost often are very calorie dense. They're not at all nutrient dense. We do a 24 hour recall with our clients before and after the, um, our nutrition education sessions. And some of the foods that we see people eating is, it's, it's, it's just sad. Um, there is a lot of, um, lot of prepared food coming into you know people are consuming foods that are prepared away from home quite a bit there's a lot of fast food there's a huge amount of soda consumption or pop or sugary beverages um, sometimes we see um, 
10 or 12 servings, you know, a serving is only in eight ounces, but we see people consuming 64 to 80 ounces of soda in a day, which is just a huge amount of calories without any other nutrient in it. Uh, we see a lot of fried meats, fried chicken, for instance, being consumed. Um, we see other forms of meat. Uh, we see a lot of refined grain being consumed, um, whether it's at, as uh, white bread or as uh, pasta. Uh, what we don't see a lot of is very little of vegetables, very little of uh, fresh vegetables being consumed, and very little fruit um, and minimal dairy uh, foods from these groups consumed. Uh, um, if you eat healthy food, if you eat um, a diet that has uh, a, a variety in it, you know, eating from the different food groups, eating more fruits and vegetables, eating more whole grains, uh, eating from low fat dairy, and choosing low fat um, or leaner cuts of meats and eating beans and uh, other sources of protein uh, in your diet, your, your risk for chronic diseases goes down substantially. You're better able to manage your weight um, so that uh, we know obesity has very direct links to, um, to a number of chronic diseases and we know if we can um, manage manage the weight issue without going on diets and you know without uh, feeding into the billions of dollars of the industry of um, different types of diets that are out there none of which are sustainable if we can just make changes lifestyle changes um, we'll we'll be closer to preventing a number of chronic diseases and if you do eat um, more fruits and vegetables you are um, you are getting the most nutrient dense food in your diet and um, you're also um, you're able to eat, get full on fewer calories and uh, enjoy it. they taste great fruits and vegetables have a great taste but you know you just just need to experiment and find what you like and um, incorporate those in your diet so there are many reasons why we should be eating fruits and vegetables but unfortunately we do not the latest recommendations suggest that we should be eating um, between 7 to 13 servings or about four and a half to six and a half cups of fruits and vegetables every day, we barely manage four to five servings per, per day. So, you know, the previous recommendations were that we should eat at least five servings of fruits and vegetables. About 80% of the people do not eat that many fruits and vegetables. So there is a big gap between where we ought to be and where we are. And there are many, many barriers to, um, to eating at the level where the recommendations are. And one of the uh, issues is uh, related to access and availability. But we also collaborate with programs like City Fresh, where not only are we providing the education and the tools for people to health, stay healthy, but we are also changing the environment by which when, when these two things, when education and environmental changes come together, we see the fruits of that um, very evident. We do, we uh, evaluate our nutrition education program. And last year, um, on a small sample, what we found was that people who participated in our nutrition education sessions at City Fresh Fresh Stops doubled their consumption of fruits and vegetables. Now that's, you know, I have been doing nutrition education for a long period of time and I have never seen uh, changes of that magnitude and we are evaluating it again this year to see if those you know if we see those uh, similar results this year um, so uh, it's it's the environmental change coupled with educational change that's going to bring about the behavior change that we are all seeking emotion is an attitude and when you take a child and you push the child out the house without a meal and that child is given a meal provided by the government. And that government meal is full of uh, high fructose corn syrup. And that food is full of starch. And that child is asked to sit in the classroom under one of these teachers and perform off of that. Something's gonna happen. Three of those 25 or 35 children are gonna end up in detention because they just can't control all that sugar and all that starch. Blessing being there that they have something in their stomachs is not a balanced thing. Well, they don't need to think of it in a, as an ecosystem because in conventional agriculture, the soil is basically a medium to hold plants up in. And we force feed plants with water-soluble artificial fertilizers. 
So the plants don't have any choice. If you make a fertilizer soluble, then the roots don't have any choice. They'll have, they have to take that up. In organic agriculture, the, the soil, the fertilizer comes through the soil. So it comes through the soil water as a, as a sort of a solution through humus um, and acidifying fungi and other organisms in the soil that are releasing all the, that are chelating and releasing all of those nutrients and making them available. So it's coming through the soil water and that sort of exchange. So uh, that's the way it goes. I think overall, you know, we've kind of seen this grand experiment. It's a grand global experiment. Uh, with how we grow our food uh, and we have some powerful uh, corporations that are promoting genetically engineered products that are promoting petrochemical based products. Uh, this industrial food system is a global scale experiment and I say it's an experiment because we don't know how that experiment is going to play out and right now we're seeing a lot of uh, long term impacts from soil erosion to climate change to loss of biological diversity all that are related to how we're currently growing food in this industrial food system. And when I say it's an experiment, I'm saying that we're getting into some territory we just don't know about. Um, when we're modifying the very genetic structures of plants and putting that into the world, we don't know what effect that's going to have on local ecosystems, on health. There could be gene combinations that end up having impacts that we can't even envision ahead of time. And yet the stuff is, is going out there with, with great pace. And I think Part of what we're doing is saying that's one global experiment and that's one kind of approach. Um, there's some flaws in that and it's not uh, in our best interest to be necessarily putting our eggs in that basket. We really need to look at alternatives that are ecologically based. We really need to ask ourselves how can we supply our basic food needs without undermining biological diversity, without undermining the environmental quality that really is about our future. Um, if we have a food system that's eroding soil, that's polluting the water, uh, that's not a food system that's gonna be reliable in 100 years because we've undermined the entire base of what we've been doing. And we, the, when the New Agrarian Center um, started to manage the, the George Jones Farm as a community farm and education center, um, we had taken over a farm that previously was following basic industrial agriculture. It was corn and soybeans, a lot of heavy equipment, a lot of chemicals uh, sprayed. Um, we found a soil that was pretty much completely denuded of, of topsoil. Um, so in many ways, the farm became kind of this microcosm for the impacts of industrial agriculture. And then the process of how do you go about restoring um, the farm ecosystem? And when I say farm ecosystem, I mean the topsoil, the habitat, um, the biological diversity, kind of all those things. How do we restore that ecological health uh, to the system? Absolutely. There's a, there's a nice book from the 50s, I think it's an American book actually, Topsoil and Civilization. And, and it, um, Topsoil and Civilization, and it just maps um, for thousands of years all of these civilizations that have come and gone and the relationship between their treatment of the soil and um, and their longevity, and uh, all of those soils, all of those, um, and obviously some of those have had some climate change events when that happens. Um, but a lot of those climate change events have been um, induced by uh, removal of forests and removal of soils and all of the rest of it. So yeah, there's there's a direct connect between the uh, the health of a the true health of a nation. And the, um, and the health of its soils. If you look um, historically and even anthropologically, you can see a lot of um, actual correlations between biological diversity and the you know, health of local ecosystems and the pres presence of indigenous cultures. Um, so there are ways that, that people have historically have interacted with their land that are not environmentally destructive. In fact, that, that could be environmentally beneficial. So I think that that's kind of the orientation of local food systems. It's about restoring those local food webs. And um, if that's happening as it is right now across the nation, this is a you know, national, if not global movement, um, it's about all of us kind of restoring those local food webs on our own. But then um, so, you know, those sorts of practices of 
building up our gardens, making our landscapes edible as opposed to ornamental or a combination of both um, at least so that we can build all of these base food resources in our suburbs around our houses and, uh, and then ultimately go out into our farms. If we all did that, then we would need less farmland. And that farmland could then be um, returned to some sort of native state. Now, that was one of the original premises of permaculture that if we actually brought food production into our homes and around our homes, zoned it back there again, um, then we wouldn't need to have anywhere near as much land covered with the destructive practice that is agriculture. Um, of everything from family farms, Amish farms, um, retired people and young people growing food in vacant lots in the city, um, here at the Jones Farm, uh, young folks coming out of Oberlin College or from the local community, uh, learning how to farm, and uh, I think together we're starting to, you know, create something that's, that's more sustainable. Mm -hmm. But it's all rooted in community, and I think that's the connection between the food we eat and where we live, um, is that community, because food is what uh, creates that community, and that community is what's needed to restore our uh, ecosystems back to uh, health.